In the early pre-dawn hours of November 13, 1960, 150 Guatemalan soldiers raided the Matamoros barracks in Guatemala City, seizing weapons, jeeps, and tanks. Their commanders were part of a larger conspiracy of junior officers who commanded one-third of the army. The rebel soldiers captured key military bases in Zacapa and Puerto Barrios, but these early victories were undermined when a majority of conspirators failed to join the rebellion as planned. Their progress halted. The rebel soldiers fortified their positions and waited. President Miguel de Gras Fuentes and the military high command of Guatemala had anticipated the rebellion, the planning of which had gone on for more than a year. As the plot neared fruition, the army began to arrest junior officers, likely contributing to cold feet for many of the would-be rebels. Fuentes had spent the past several months warning of an imminent communist invasion by Cuba, and he seized upon the rebellion as proof positive that the rebel officers were receiving their orders from Fidel Castro and communist agents. There were indeed Cubans in Guatemala. Hundreds had infiltrated the country over the past several months. A total of 1,500 Cubans would eventually arrive at secret military training camps. These Cubans were not communists, however, nor were they taking orders from Fidel Castro. These were CIA training camps run by agency contractors. The instructors were mostly American, but some were from Eastern Europe. What they had in common was ideology and a professional skill set. They were anti-communist special operators, and they were very good at killing communists. But there was no communist threat in Guatemala. While later experiences would radicalize the survivors of the rebellion into Marxist guerrillas, the rebel officers of 1960 were diverse in ideology, spanning from the left to the right. They shared a sense of national pride and frustration at the policies of President Fuentes. In particular, they regarded the presence of foreign military bases as an insult and a threat to national sovereignty. As they waited, the rebel officers no doubt remembered the events of 1944. During that summer, mass protests ousted the dictator Jorge Ubico. Demonstrators continued to mobilize against his successor who tried to uphold the dictatorship. After months of mass mobilization against the regime, young military officers joined the struggle and toppled the dictatorship in October of 1944. It was the end of Guatemala's Banana Republic era and the beginning of a brief period of constitutional rule and New Deal-style social democracy known as the Ten Years of Spring. In 1950, one of the hero officers of 1944, Jacobo Arbenz, was elected president with 65% of the vote. Arbenz was a radical reformer, moderate in his politics, but economically inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was nowhere near a communist, but he allowed communists to participate in political life, eventually asking leaders of the PGT, the Guatemalan Labor Party, to advise him during his presidency. The PGT was an independent communist party with no significant links to the Soviet Union. The PGT leaders were petty bourgeois and Ladino, practically white in a majority indigenous country. They were small in membership, but they earned respect from indigenous labor organizers by demonstrating honesty and integrity. The rural masses regarded the PGT as a partner in struggle, despite the organization's small size and demographic differences. Arben sought advice from the PGT leadership due to their exceptional understanding of the social and economic problems of Guatemala. The PGT was integral to the crafting of the agrarian reform law. The massively popular law extended labor protections and enforcement into the feudal plantations where most Guatemalans lived. It also redistributed uncultivated land, for which the owners would be compensated according to market prices. For the crime of replacing feudalism with constitutional rights in the countryside, the Guatemalan Revolution needed to be crushed. The Guatemalan right wing failed to topple Arbenz, as they had failed to topple Arevalo before him but the United Fruit Company would spend years and millions of dollars lobbying the United States, targeting both Democrats and Republicans. President Truman authorized Operation Fortune, Eisenhower Operation Success, 
both tasked the CIA with regime change. The CIA recruited the incompetent Castillo Armas to lead a small invasion force. They lost every engagement with the Guatemalan army, but Arbenz's unwillingness to enact emergency measures left the revolution vulnerable. CIA-sponsored sabotage, bombings, and a hemisphere-wide disinformation campaign threw the country into chaos. Many of his civilian supporters, including a young Che Guevara, appealed for weapons. The arming of militant workers had thwarted coups past, but Arbenz refused until the last minute. He instructed the military to distribute weapons, but it was far too late. His generals refused to carry out the order. It was the end of his presidency and the end of the Ten Years of Spring. Labor organizers and communists were arrested en masse. Land was violently seized and returned to the wealthy landowners and foreign corporations. Economic chaos and political instability characterized each successive coup regime, prompting growing discontentment from within the Guatemalan military. When Fuentes took power in a nominally democratic election in 1958, he set about creating an anti-communist bourgeois republic that would solve the land and economic problems of the country without alienating large landowners and capitalists. When the right-wing utopian project failed, Hidigaras instead relied on the division of his enemies and violent repression to remain in power. It was November 13, 1960, when President Fuentes received word that the rebel uprising had begun. He contacted his CIA allies, and together, the Guatemalan Army and Cuban anti-communist mercenaries of Brigade 2506 launched non-stop attacks on rebel positions for the next three days. As casualties mounted, the surviving rebels retreated into the hills. On the 16th, a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier arrived off the coast of Guatemala, carrying 85 fighter bombers and 2,000 U.S. Marines under the pretext of a supposed invasion by the Cuban army. These accusations were absurd. The only foreign invasion that had taken place was that of the hundreds of armed Cubans preparing for a counter-revolution in Cuba under the sponsorship of the United States. Brigade 2506 was created with one mission. Invade Cuba, overthrow Fidel Castro, and restore American domination over Cuba. Some had previously supported Castro. Others had supported the Batista dictatorship. They, too, were united by a violent hatred of communists. And so they volunteered, enthusiastically, to put down the Guatemalan rebellion. From their perspective, shedding communist blood, whether Guatemalan or Cuban, was a cause worth fighting for. Felix Rodriguez a former Brigade 2506 fighter and CIA officer, described his participation in crushing the rebellion. Just about everyone volunteered to help the Guatemalan president, and 200 of us were selected. We were issued weapons, then trucked to the air base where we were to board planes that would take us to Puerto Barrios. It was incredible to watch from the hatch of our C-46 as the bombers dived, circled, and dived again to do their deadly work. One scored a direct hit on a truckload of rebel soldiers, and from our vantage point 2,000 feet away, some of us said later they could see their bodies fly. By November 17th, the rebellion against President Fuentes was over. The leaders arrested or in hiding. In the 2009 book, The Bay of Pigs, Cuba 1961, a celebratory account of Brigade 2506's history, Felix Rodriguez is portrayed as a Cuban patriot set on liberating Cuba from the communists. Rodriguez would play a key role in the capture and murder of Ernesto Che Guevara in 1967. In his decades-long career, Rodriguez was responsible for anti-communist violence in Cuba, El Salvador, and Vietnam. He shared photos depicting the severed hands of Guevara to friends, a copy of which was shown to John Lee Anderson in 1997. Anderson noted that the photo was accompanied by Rodriguez's signature and a friendly note to the recipient. Accounts sympathetic to Brigade 2506 emphasized the courage and tenacity of the fighters who would later be stranded and largely captured in the Playa Giron. Yet the events of November 13, 1960 
draw attention to an uncomfortable truth. From the very beginning, the anti-Castro movement was aligned with the most anti-democratic forces in Latin America. Their first taste of combat did not occur in the beaches of Cuba in April 1961. They occurred in the skies over Puerto Barrios as anti-communist Cubans dropped bombs on Guatemalans. They helped to crush the rebellion of November 13th. It was the opening salvo of what would become a gruesome 36-year civil war and genocide. Accounts of the Bay of Pigs invasion often gloss over the Guatemala episode, in part because it subverts the narrative of a Cuban revolution betrayed by Castro and illuminates the internationalism of the Latin American bourgeoisie. For all the attention given to the internationalism of the Cuban revolution, the cross-national regional solidarity between privileged classes, often with military or paramilitary backing, preceded the militarization of the Cuban Revolution and Castro's consolidation of power. This is not to absolve the Cuban revolutionaries, Castro first and foremost, of criticism, but rather to provide context to understand why Latin American revolutionaries, or for that matter, revolutionaries worldwide, hardened after the 1954 coup and counter-revolution in Guatemala. Arevalo and Arbenz eschewed militancy and terror in favor of diplomacy and compromise, even when dealing with bad faith actors, specifically the United States and the Latin American upper classes. If Guatemala had actually resembled the Red Menace caricature illustrated by the CIA and bourgeois newspapers of the Americas, it might have stood a chance. Referring to false allegations that a Red Terror was occurring in Guatemala, Guevara noted, if those shootings had taken place, the government would retain the possibility of fighting back. Chapter 1. Counter-Revolution in Guatemala In 1945, the Guatemalan people elected Juan José Arevalo, a university professor, in the country's first legitimate presidential election. Almost immediately, conservative elements within Guatemala began plotting. During Arevalo's term alone, the Guatemalan Revolution survived dozens of coup attempts and aborted plots. The most severe threats came from the Army Chief of Staff, Francisco Arana. In 1949, Arana announced plans to run for president. In a clear violation of the Constitution, he refused to resign his post as Army Chief, threatening to use the military to seize and dissolve Congress if it rejected his candidacy. In response, the Arevalo government hatched a plot to arrest and send the insurgent major into exile. Arana was killed while resisting arrest, prompting accusations of assassination from the right wing. The year after Arana's death, Jacobo Arbenz was elected president with 65% of the vote, easily defeating the 19% vote chair of Miguel Idegras Fuentes. Over 70% of eligible voters participated in the elections, the new government was popular, while the right-wing opposition was splintered and weak. Despite dozens of attempts, the right-wing of Guatemala proved incapable of dislodging either Arevalo or Arbenz. In 1952, the government enacted Decree 900, the agrarian reform law crafted by Arbenz in consultation with members of the PGT. During this time, the CIA was a relatively young intelligence agency officially formed in 1947 as the successor to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which had originally formed during World War II to conduct spy operations against the Axis powers. Between 1953 and 61, the CIA was run by Alan Dulles, one of the most notorious spy masters in American history. During his tenure, Dulles presided over several coup operations against left-leaning governments, including Iran and Guatemala. Dulles and his brother, John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's Secretary of State and a board member of the United Fruit Company, had spent decades in the diplomatic and intelligence services of the United States. The Dulles brothers were both lawyers who, as private citizens, engaged in private lobbying on behalf of wealthy clients. Both were early admirers of Nazism and Adolf Hitler, with Allen spending much of the war and early post-war era protecting his friends and contacts in the Third Reich. In 
Allen even directly disobeyed and undermined the FDR administration's policy of unconditional surrender, carefully destroying evidence out of fear that he might later be charged with treason. Dulles biographer David Talbot posits that Dulles would have been prosecuted if not for Roosevelt's death at the end of the war. Describing his OSS career during World War II as a reign of treason, he was never punished for his role in securing the rehabilitation of former Nazis, nor his efforts to slow the dissemination of news that the Nazis were exterminating the Jews of Europe. After the war, Dulles secured the political future of former Nazi intelligence officers and used them to build West Germany's intelligence apparatus, justifying his actions on the basis that most men of the caliber required to run the new Germany suffer a political taint. We have already found out that you can't run railroads without taking in some Nazi party members. Subscribe to the movements on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Support the show at patreon.com slash movementspod.